knowing that we're prone to forget what we should remember and to remember what we should forget, the Bible contains several passages that help us bring to our minds how he has dealt with us in the past. The book of Psalms contains several chapters that recount Israel's history with God, for example, not just for the purpose of education, but also for motivation to live right now in light of what has transpired in the past. It is something to help in the present day living, not just a, a description of what used to be. There are countless life lessons in Scripture. God has given to us His Word to benefit us and to help us in what He has for us. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 15:4 that whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. I like that, that God wrote these things in the past for our learning and our benefit today. The text that I've chosen for this study is Psalm 78, and it's one of those uh, historical psalms that I mentioned. It's the longest one in this altar, and it was definitely written for our learning in the present. The introductory verses 1 through 8 remind parents, grandparents, and really all of us to tell our children what has been so that they will able, be able to do what God expects them to do going forward. Histories like the one we will read today should never be repeated by successive generations of believers, and we'll see that as we get into the study. So, by God's grace and our obedience, they won't be repeated. We will learn from the past, and we will live differently today. Let's take a moment to ask the Lord's blessing before we begin. Father, we do thank you that we can come before you once again in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word, which is forever established in heaven. Thank you that we have a copy of Scripture, maybe several of them, in our house. But, Father, we are able to open your word and see right now in real time what you want us to know, what you want us to do. Um, we'll see who you are and who we are as well. So, Father, it's always an exciting thing to open the Word of God. May it be a wonderful experience for us today as we share this time online together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, around here, a new school year is just beginning. Every morning as I walk our dog, I, I see students and parents with little ones standing at the various bus pickup sites throughout my neighborhood. Buses are picking up the students, the flashing lights, the whole thing. It's fall. We're back in it, guys. Uh, and then they take them to school where teachers stand in front of their classes ready to impart knowledge to this generation. This is the picture of Psalm 78. Our instructor here is Asaph, and he lets us know that it's time to pay attention to what he has to say. He uses a, a typical Old Testament wisdom introduction in, in verse 1. Here it is. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your words, ears rather, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. So he's saying, pay attention, heads up, let's get going. I have something to teach you. And this teacher's lesson plan has three parts that I'd like to share with you um, from the 78th Psalm, the first few verses. First of all, we need to continually think back on what has been. We should never forget where we've come from, folks. History didn't begin yesterday or when we got up this morning. There is a backstory to each truth. There is a context for each condition, and there is a record for each event. The things Asaph will tell us are not nearly as helpful without a knowledge of what has come before. So before he tells us what to do, he tells us what has happened in the past. It's, a, it's, it's the only way to do things. And we should do that in our lives as well. So we're going to take a walk through Israel's past before we get to the actual uh, lesson what we should do today. Now, it's not a pretty picture. Throughout the Old Testament, we find that Israel continually forgets the Lord. Continually forgets the Lord. They have a very short memory for some reason. Even though God had done amazing things for them from the very beginning, they have a bad case of what you done for me lately, Lord Syndrome. We have that as well sometimes, don't we? Here's an example in verses 10 and 11. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. They forgot the Lord. They forgot what he had done um, almost immediately as we read the text and, and look at the rest of the Old Testament, if we had time to do that today, there are things that God did for them, and 
Well, the, the manna is still in their mouth. They're complaining about something. We have a tendency to do that as well. We forget what we should remember. Israel does that. The second thing, Israel continually forsakes the Lord. They f forget the Lord. It's a short step from uh, forgetting to forsaking. Rather than keeping their end of the covenant that Jehovah swore with them, the people are often contentious, rebellious, and yes, disobedient. Not once in a while, I said, but almost constantly. Here's verses 17 through 19. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. It's an amazing thing to me that the people of God could have such a low impression uh, of him, of what he's done for them, and can that quickly turn uh, on him. They are forgetting the Lord, they are forsaking the Lord, and they are continually becoming faithless to the Lord. Skip down to me with me to verses 34 through 37 for some more uh, examples from their history. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the Most High God their Redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. So they weren't faithful. Now, if you know scripture, you know that it's required in God's people and stewards, the New Testament says, required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Here's verses 40 to 42, and you see if they sound faithful to you here. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God, and they limited, this is, this is amazing, they limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. And it goes on and on from there. But it's a major problem when God's people do not remain faithful to him. Now, God never treats us that way, ever. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.13, we see that it says this, If we are faithless, God is faithful. He cannot deny himself. You see, if even a word of his promise failed, even a smidget, the Lord would be acting contrary to his own word and character. He cannot do that. He will not do that. He is faithful. He will be faithful. Not so man. In fact, we're just the opposite. Here are some of the examples in this psalm. Remember, Asaph is reminding the people of Israel. He's not telling them new stuff. Verse 3 says, this is stuff you've heard before. But he is giving them um, examples to remind them. So, in verse 13, he divided the Red Sea so the people could march through on dry ground. That was their recent history. In verse 14, he says that he led you through the wilderness with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Verses 15 and 16, God brought water out of a rock. Out of a rock during the wilderness wanderings. How could you forget that? And then verses 23 to 29 talks in an amazing section that God provided bread and meat from heaven to feed them when they hungered. He calls it bread from heaven. He calls it angel food. It, it was something unheard of. They had nothing to eat, and all of a sudden they woke up in the morning and there was manna. They didn't know what it was, but they found they could eat it, and they had got sustenance from it. Then they complained for not having meat, and God sent them quail. So God had been so faithful to them, they didn't deserve a bit of it. Just like folks, you and I don't deserve a bit of God's faithfulness to us. Let's just be honest. Let's be honest. We have no right to complain, ever. When to say God has left us hanging or lagging or lacking, it just doesn't happen. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is the testimony of the true, genuine child of God. So he did all this for them without their gratitude, or with flattery and make-believe, uh, you know, thankful but not really thankful. But did God cast them aside when they repeatedly did so? Well, of course not. He did what he always does for them and for us when we fail him. Look, at, I love verse 38. But, so in the midst of all these things they were doing wrong, this is a great contrast, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. You know, memory is a great gift. The older we get, the more memories we have, but the more things that can spill out, and sometimes we can't remember as well as we used to, right? 
But memory is a gift, but it also is a great responsibility. The word remember is actually found 240 times in the Bible, from remembering our Creator in the days of our youth, to remembering from whence we've fallen, if we've sinned against the Lord, to remembering all God's benefits to us in Psalm 103. It is a good thing to think back on what God has done for us and how we responded in the past so that we can do better in the present situation. And if we have trouble remembering, as we often do, we, all we have to do is ask God's indwelling memory jogger to help. Because when Jesus left after his earthly ministry, ascending to the Father, he promised the Holy Spirit who has since come, and this is what he said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. That's John 14, 26. Write it down, believe it, claim it, follow it. If you're having trouble remembering something, ask the Holy Spirit to remind you. He's there. That's one of his functions gracious, blessed functions for us. So you have not because you ask not, brother. You need to ask, sister. So after we've taken this first step and we have um, thought back on what has been and how we've got worked with us and so on, we need to take stock of what our life is now. So you start with looking back. You know, you learn from the past, but you can't live in the past. That's a one-way street right there. But as we learn from the past, it, get, it grounds us, it prepares us, it pro provides for us the future so that we have a, a context to our lives, right? So we, we have this opportunity now and responsibility, vital responsibility, to evaluate, listen, to evaluate where we are in the present as it relates to what God wants us to do and how obedient we are, we are being. Verse 2 contains a key word to help us do so. I'm going to read 2 and 3. Psalm 78, 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. I mentioned earlier, these are things that they know, but it's things that they need to remember, and then they need to do something with once they have, once they have remembered. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, Jesus used stories very effectively during his earthly ministry, probably the greatest storyteller of all time. But we typically define his parables as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. When Asaph mentions the word parable, he did it in verse 2, he's not telling a story, it's not a fictitious story, he's calling for a self-examination. That's because para means alongside of, and balain means to throw. So a parable here is the placing of one thing alongside another for a healthy comparison. In the 78th Psalm, our teacher is setting the past history of Israel alongside the present situation of his students so that they won't repeat their ancestors or their own mistakes. So it's a laying side by side, it's a comparison, it's an assessment, an evaluation of how you're doing right now. So yes, we have a history, but we also have today's story. Now this is a necessary step in learning and passing on. The New Testament admonishes us to make sure we're saved, for example. Paul wrote this to the second letter in the second letter to the Corinthians. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So he says, one of the things that we should do is to examine ourselves. You can't examine somebody else's heart. You can look at their fruit. But we've got enough, a full-time job examining ourselves, evaluating how am I doing? Am I walking with the Lord? Am I following what he said to do? Have I made promises that I haven't kept? Are there uh, sins that I'm committing that I need to stop? That type of a thing, right? And he says also in Galatians 6, 4, dealing now with how we live for Jesus, um, in, in our interactions with the, the church family. He says this, Let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Listen, folks, self-examination shouldn't just take place before we partake of the communion elements each month. It's an ongoing, necessary step to ensure the personal faithfulness um, that we will need if we're going to be able to do the final thing from our text. So it says we need to take time 
to remember what has been. We need to take stock of what is now, of what our life is, of how things are going. And then we need to train our kids for the future. Now, this is the place that ASAF has been, has been moving us. This is the main uh, point that we need to look at today, is the idea of telling it to our children. But you have to have an it to tell. You can't teach what you don't know. You can't share what you haven't experienced. So we have the first two. We're ready to go. And now we say, what can I impart to the next generation? How can I transfer the treasure of God's truth to the little ones entrusted to my care? We need to train our kids for the future. This is in verses 4 through 8. You know, where would we be? Where would we be if over the centuries the remnant of the Jewish spiritual leaders hadn't preserved the scriptures for us? And now, with the revealed revelation complete, we have an entire life curriculum to impart to those who come after us, beginning in our own homes, and on and on from there. See, the early church only had the Old Testament writing. But we have the whole thing. So let's look at some of the particulars of an instruction that is biblical. We want to stick with a biblical uh, teaching instruction curriculum, and there is things in verses 4 and 5 um, at least five things here that help us. The first thing, we need to tell the children about God's praises and that he is praiseworthy. That's in verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. And so first of all, there's a couple in the same verse, but first of all, his praises. Listen, folks, make your kids worshipers of the Most High God, and they will always be able to please Him and enjoy a proper perspective on life, because God inhabits the praises of His people, and the praises include songs and scripture readings and prayers and offerings. And so God delights when we do that, when we are praising Him. Make your home a praise and worship filled environment. There's many ways to do it. Scripture on the walls, um, certainly scripture music, uh, spiritual music in the background. Sing to your newborn baby and your youngsters and go ahead and sing some of the crazy songs and the fun songs, but sing them God's songs as well. There's a lot of them, aren't there? Um, babies listen, they, t they tune in and they, they perk up when we're singing to them. Sing about Jesus and start them on a wonderful road of discovery of the goodness and greatness of God that will make them lifelong worshipers. Tell the children about God's praises. Secondly, tell the children about God's power. We saw that here in the second part of the verse. Um, uh, the praises of the Lord and His strength, right? His power is best shown um, in, in our, our daily living. When you relate the true stories from the Bible about how God has worked on behalf of His own, mingled with testimonies from your own experience of his divine supply, and you need to have some, and you better not keep quiet about it, it will get the attention and captivate the interest of your kids. It will give them a platform for their own budding faith in his goodness. So like when God answers a prayer, let, let the kids know. Don't, don't keep your, your problems from them. This is a family issue. As they get older, Explain to them, we're going to pray to God, and he's never let us down. And, and we're going to give this to him and write it down, and here's when it was prayed, and here's how it was answered, and when. That would be marvelous things to build their faith. Tell the children about God's power. Thirdly, tell the children about God's practices. Because it says here, next, uh, tell the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Now it's interesting that the, the phrase wonderful works translates one Hebrew word, it's the word works, but all of God's works are marvelous and wonderful and extraordinary. I hope you've learned what Job did when he said, God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. I hope that you're living a miraculous life, I don't mean that Lake Michigan parting so you can walk on the way from Illinois to Michigan. I'm talking about the miracles every day, the miracles of life and of sustenance and provision and guidance. When God helps you to see something, when God helps you to avoid something, don't tell me that doesn't happen every day again and again and again because if you're a child of God, I don't believe it's not happening because it's been my experience since I've walked with the Lord these many years 
that that's how he takes care of me. And these are mundane things, but they are miracles in view of what could have been and what others are going through. When God answers a prayer or meets a need, as I said, big or small, let the kiddos know so they will learn that they can rely on him for their own needs. And their own needs are just as great as yours to their little eyes and their little hearts, right? The things they worry about are just as important as paying a mortgage, paying off the car, or a sickness because they have their own life and their own sphere and their own understanding and they need to trust Jesus when they're young. Listen, so they will trust Jesus when they're your age and mine. These are the particulars. Tell the children about God's praises, about God's power, about God's practices, and then in verse 5, about God's precepts. Here's the fifth verse. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Known to their children. Known to their children. There's a, there's a, there's a message here. Tell it to the children, Asaph says. Now the word testimonies and law refer to the Bible. They are synonyms, they're euphemisms for the greatest textbook of all. Law, testimonies, statutes, precepts. These all refer to God's inerrant word. As you tell your kids who God is and what he has done, don't neglect to tell them what he has said. Devotions, daily devotions, family devotions, reading the scripture, as I said, memory verses on the wall, point it out to them, make it clear to them, quote verses, quote verses you, you and the missus, quote together, talk about the Lord. Don't keep this stuff from them, share it with them. And do it 24-7, 365, in the natural, spontaneous way. It should be as simple as walking, and it should, in fact, accompany all that. One of the most famous passages in the Old Testament about child raising and doing this very thing is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to read for you seven or so verses. There, here it goes. Uh, 6 1, Deuteronomy. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you. You and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Amen. Never miss an opportunity. Never miss a chance to pass your faith along to those that God has entrusted to you, mom and dad, and grandparents in an, in an exciting role as well, or even just people in the church. Your kids are raised. You didn't have kids. You weren't married. So you have nieces and nephews. You have church kids. You have the generation of the saints. And so we have a responsibility, all of us, beginning, and especially, of course, with the parents. But right down the line to do this for the next generation, for those that God has given to us. And so these are the particulars of an instruction that is biblical. But there is a purpose of instruction that is biblical as well, and that's in verse 6. Uh, Psalm 78, 6. That, so that, because, right, so that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. So this, someone mentioned there's like five generations here. You, we heard from our generation, our, our ancestors, our parents, our fathers, tell us, we tell the kids, the kids tell their kids, the kids tell their kids, and so on and on it goes. The way God wants us to transfer what is truth and what is right about God. We want our children to know God's precepts and provisions because we want them to know Him. That's the goal. That's the reason. To know Him personally, by faith, just as we have come to know Him. And beginning when our kids uh, were, were pregnant and awaiting our, our, our grandchildren that were going to come into the world, we prayed for them, my wife and I. We prayed that, uh, obviously, for safety, physical safety for mom and for baby. But we also prayed that they would come to know Jesus as their Savior. And we've prayed that ever since, just about every day I prayed that. There's a certain place in town that I drive by several times a day, and every time I drive by, just about every time I drive by, I say, uh, I ask for the Lord to bring 
these people and my my uh, kids and grandkids and family and my partners in the community to faith in Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing they'll ever do. It's, it's the biggest thing I want. Um, I want them to know my Jesus. So even after they've committed their lives to Christ, we teach not just for information, that's part of it, but also for inspiration. Listen, folks, I know you know this, but we live in a hopeless world. From 2009 to 2019, the proportion of high school students reporting persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness increased by 40%. That's a lot. Those seriously considering attempting suicide increased by 36%. And the actual suicide rate in this time period among youths, uh, young people ages 10 to 24 in the U.S. increased by a whopping 57%. How could that be? I remember when I was a child. I remember when I was a young person. I didn't have despair. I didn't have hopelessness. What has happened? Well, look what's going on in the world. Look how things have changed down through the years. And besides these terrible statistics and suicide, attempted or thoughts of suicide, countless others on a daily basis suffer related issues of anxiety, depression, leading to eating disorders, and behavioral issues. That's not the, that's not the plan God has for us. That's not what God wants for our young people at all. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope, and a future. But because this is so important, your kids will not get that message out there. They won't get that in the world. They won't get that on, on most of social media, certainly not with the world controls. They don't get that in schools because that's, that's just not school's function, right? They need to get that from you, mom, and you, dad, you grandparents. And that's what we see as the word of God is given to them as we build a household of faith in our young ones, they have hope. Look at uh, Psalm 78 and verse 7. Uh, verse 6, so we do this so that the generation to come might know them and know him, so that, an additional, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. His verse 8, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Listen, they're going to get it from you or they're not, they're going to get it from you or they're not going to get it, friend. What greater responsibility is there than this? We have physical welfare, we take care of them, we get them to soccer practice or ballet or softball. We're busier than ever taking our kids here, there and the other place. And we're taking care of them in those areas and they're fed well and the whole thing. But if you neglect the spiritual aspect, you have you have missed the most important thing. The most important thing in this life and the next. Let's break the cycle of rebellion, repentance, relief, and rebellion again that we see throughout Psalm 78 and throughout the Old Testament. And many times throughout our own lives, if we were honest. And let's say together, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Tell it to your children filling up their minds and hearts with the things of the Lord. Tell it with your laughter. Tell it with your talk. Tell it when you're working and tell it when you walk. Tell it in the morning. Tell it in the night. May it be your life, your joy, your delight. Whisper when you're near. Shout it from afar. Make it what you live. Make it what you are. Tell it to your children and your children's children that Jesus must be Lord of their lives. I took those words kind of loosely from uh, a song by Bill and Gloria Gaither, Tell It to Your Children. Let's do that, shall we? Let's tell it to our children so that the generation to come will exceed the generation past and our own generation in godliness and holiness and faithfulness unto the Lord. You want your kids to do better? That's not just financially. That's not just educationally. I want my kids and my grandkids to be more like Jesus than I am where my father's and mother's and my background were. Well, thanks for listening, friend. Another uh, exciting study from uh, the wonderful book of Psalms. I pray that you will make application to your own life and to your family as the Holy Spirit enables you. And I always pray and trust that you'll join me again next time. God bless.